Hello, my name is Professor Joshua Naselski, and welcome to Cropping Systems. This is one of my favorite courses to teach. I've been doing it for a number of years now, and I'm posting our Tuesday lectures online on YouTube, and I'm doing that for a number of reasons. Uh, the most important one being I'm presenting the more drier theoretical material on Tuesdays, and Putting it online is going to let you watch whenever you want. It's going to let you pause, easier to take notes. You can rewind if your attention wandered. It's going to be more efficient than you know me lecturing live and you having to take notes in real time. Uh, and number two, uh, I want to save our in-person interactions for interactions. So our labs and seminars are going to be much more interactive. And so we're doing the more drier stuff, the more luxury stuff online only. So without further ado, let's get into the course content. It's going to be review for most of you, but we should all be on the same level before we start the course. In this introductory lecture, we're going to first appreciate how far cropping systems in modern agriculture has come in the last 100 years or so and introduce you to the G by E by M framework, which is the linchpin, the absolute linchpin of this course. All right, this is some context. So this is the human population. Uh, from, let's say, 0 BC all the way to 2020. You can see up until 1920, maybe you can say 1820 if you want to be more specific. But for most of human history, you know, human population has been growing pretty slowly over time. And this was entirely due to the fact that there was not enough food, right? People, people were just always hungry. Now, your grandparents are probably too young, uh, but my grandparents and your parents' grandparents certainly will remember being hungry at some point in their lives where, you know, we're just hangry, okay? So 1920, 1 1.8 billion people, and then the next 100 years, we basically almost quadruple the human population, almost quadruple. This is entirely due to increased agricultural productivity. There's more food, and we're not constrained by a lack of food, the vast majority of us, okay? It's easy to forget how, uh, you know, how, how the, the lack of food or the scarcity of food influenced daily life not so long ago. Again, maybe not in your grandparents, but my grandparents' time. So here there was ration books, okay, in 1947, 1948 in, the, in Great Britain, all right? So if you were in London uh, and you wanted to buy bread, you couldn't buy as much bread as you wanted like you can now. You were rationed. There was rationing. Herbert Hoover in his 1928 presidential campaign, running for president of the United States, 1928, promised people a chicken in every pot. So everyone would get a chicken and, you know, to eat. That's kind of a weird promise to make uh, for a modern politician to say, I'm going to make sure everyone has as much chicken as they want to eat. I mean, that's, that's just a weird thing to think about because there's chicken everywhere and rel it's relatively affordable. Okay. So what's going on? <clears throat> Why do we have so much, so much food, you know, so relatively quickly in the last 100 years, maybe 150 years, all right? It's due to a number of things. First, we have agricultural innovations, scientific advances. So on the left, you have Fritz Haber. He's a German scientist, won the Nobel Prize for inventing nitrogen fertilizer. Albert Einstein, that's a photo of Albert Einstein as well, uh, before, you know, he became famous uh, Einstein was obviously a patent, or if you don't know, a patent officer. He was investigating patents. And so him, uh, Einstein and Fritz Haber, they knew each other for that reason. <clears throat> so you have scientific innovation. You have farmers coming up with innovation. So you have John Deere. He was a blacksmith, and he developed a self-scouring plow. Basically, in the Midwest, the United States Midwest, you have plows that were getting just stuck in the mud. The mud was sticking to the plows, and John Deere invented a plow that could self-scour. Basically, the mud wouldn't stick to it as easily. You also have scientists like Gladys West. She, um, less well-known because she worked uh, for, the, for the government, actually for the military, helping to develop uh, global positioning systems. There's obviously military implications for GPS, but also agricultural implications, things like auto steer, things like variable rate for prescription mapping for variable rate applications. And so you have scientific innovation. You have farmers adopting these scientific innovations. A lot of the time, they're helping to develop those innovations. And so you have this confluence of farmers adopting technologies and people inventing technology. So that's why we have such a productive agricultural system. All right, so that's my, um, that's, that's my praise for agriculture. Now, many people are going to talk in a negative light. 
they're going to talk about the issues that have to do with agricultural production. So for example, we have this fertilizer loss, pollution, nitrous oxide emissions, global warming or climate change. We have losing farmland. Uh, we have lots of erosion. And so what I think, when I think about these issues, these are important issues, but when I think about them and how I want you to think of, about them is that these are consequences of massive success. These problems are consequences of success. You know, before 1920, we didn't have fertilizers or we didn't have a lot of fertilizers and crop yields were low and that therefore the human population was low. So we, we have this massive success, affordable fertilizers that farmers around the world can use. And that's a major success, a major win for humanity. And we have a consequence of that, which is more pollution. We also have rising agricultural productivity, for example. Um, and so rising agricultural productivity is going to get people interested in buying farmland. Now, we can argue that the value of farmland, especially in Ontario, is decoupled from its agricultural productivity potential, but there's a relationship there, right? People wouldn't be buying farmland, farmers and investing groups as well, unless there was a very productive use for that land, which would be farming. And in Ontario, we have something like tile drainage to thank for the massive increase in land productivity, agricultural productivity. We'll talk about that later in the course. So lots of the problems, lots of the problems associated with cropping systems today are actually consequences of success. So this is a takeaway slide, and I'll be interspersing these throughout lectures or at the end of lectures. So you know, you know what you need to know for the weekly quizzes, for the midterms, and for the final exams. What are the what is the baseline knowledge I expect you to understand? So I've been blabbing for a while, but the main takeaway here is what is the main what is most responsible for removing the constraint on human population growth? It is increased agricultural productivity, and that is due to technological innovation and invention, and then farmers who are willing to adopt those technologies. And then there's a feedback loop because farmers are going to be uh, helping to refine and improve those technologies over time. So this course is called Cropping System. So let's go ahead and define what that is. Cropping System refers to, well, crops, their sequence. We can also call that their rotation, crop rotation. So their sequence and their management and all of that adapted to a given environment. So we analyze cropping systems. We, in this course, this is the linchpin of the course, this G by E by M framework to analyze cropping systems. This is also used in the field. Uh, by actual practicing agronomists. It's not, not just an academic exercise. So the G refers to genotype, the E refers to environment, and the M refers to management. <clears throat> Let's break this down. So G, genotype, that's a really fancy word that describes the crop species. So is that corn, is that soybeans, wheat, etc. And then the variety. So even within something like soybean, we can get more specific about the genotype. What is, for example, the maturity group? Is it determinate or indeterminate? Even more specific, you know, when when was that variety released? Is it a newer variety that would be high yielding? Is it a 50-year-old variety of soybean? So we can get more specific about the genotype of that cropping system. Then we have environment. This is basically the things that a farmer doesn't control. Okay, so that would be things like climate. I'll talk about that in a moment climate versus weather. Also things like the soil. Now, uh, a farmer, you know, they're farming a piece of land and they didn't really have anything to do with the soil texture, the topography, the depth to bedrock, so how deep that soil goes, the natural soil fertility, things like the cation exchange capacity, etc. I'm expecting you having, having taken a soil science course to understand the basic kind of soil biological, chemical, and physical properties that are important for cropping systems. And, you know, mo the vast majority are, of these are not under control of the farmer. So environment is what a farmer doesn't control. And then we have management, which is all the things a farmer can control. The most important aspect of the G by E by M framework is the interactions, the X, because genotype will interact with environment, with management, and, and on and on. We have interactions between these, and I'll, I'll give you some stories, some examples about how these interactions work later. Okay, climate versus weather. So climate is a very important part of the E component, the environment component of the G by E by M 
framework, it's different than weather. Okay, weather is going to be year to year variation. Some years it's dry, some years it's cold, some years it's hot, and the farmer is adapting to the weather in a given season. But climate, the climate is going to shape the types of cropping systems that are in a given region. So here we have what we call a climatograph uh, for, in this case, Regina, Saskatchewan. So uh, the blue bars are precipitation for every month of the year on average. This is 40-year averages. So we typically take a 30 or more commonly 40-year average weather. We, we get the weather for 40 years or 30 years. We average that out, and that's the climate. So we have precipitation and then daily average temperature. And these climatographs are going to very quickly describe what's going on in a cropping system. So you look at Regina. Okay, this is in the prairies. And you can see how the... Let's just look at precipitation, how that's very unevenly distributed throughout the season, right? During the winter, there's very little precipitation, less than 20 mils. For example, in Ontario, it's not uncommon to get a single rain event that's going to give you 20 mils of precipitation. So we have very low precipitation in the winter, and then we get most of our rain, those farmers get most of their rain in May, June, and July. So compare the climatograph for Regina with this climatograph for Winchester, Ontario, uh, located about an hour drive south of Ottawa in eastern Ontario, much more evenly distributed precipitation. We also don't have any months where average precipitation is under 50 millimeters. Okay, so much wetter, okay, climate in eastern Ontario compared to Regina, Saskatchewan. And, you know, some years are going to be wetter or drier than others, but the climate is going to determine the the design of cropping systems, the rotation, uh, the types of crops that are grown, the varieties of crops that are grown, etc. Okay, so that's climate versus weather. Weather can change from year to year, but climate is what determines the design of cropping systems. Now, there is some overlap between the G, E, and M components. And don't stress out about, you know, uh, you know what is a G, E, or M. They should be fairly obvious, and when they're not, you just need to explain your reasoning. When I ask you, say, on a, on a quiz or on a midterm or final exam, you know, to describe the G by E by M components and their interactions. Let me give you an example here. So soil texture is generally not something farmers have control over. It's not really a management decision. It's an environmental aspect, the soil texture. But here you have dairy cows uh, in sand bedding. Okay, so that's actually sand that they're chilling in. And... Let's say you're a dairy farmer and you're applying manure, you know, for 50, 60, 70 years, you're applying dairy manure from your animals, from your livestock, and it's mixed in with the sand because that's their bedding. So you have a mostly manure and then there's a bunch of sand in there as well. There's been plenty of studies that have shown that over 60, 70 years, if you're applying manure from, you know, sand bedding, uh, you're going to change the soil texture, at least in the topsoil, because you're applying so much sand over time. So, you know, soil texture, that's not really under the control of the farmer, but there's some exceptions, okay? So there's some overlap. Similarly, uh, soil, soil organic matter can change slowly over time based on farmer management decisions. But on a year-to-year -year basis, a decade-to-decade -decade basis, you know, management is not going to really influence soil properties um, generally. Again, there's, there's plenty of exceptions, things like land leveling that can shape the topography. But don't get hung up too much on these on these overlaps. Another one that uh, students can get confused about is, you know, variety. You know, variety selection is, is, is the farmer that's making that decision, what type of variety to grow. But the variety itself is a genotype. So is that, is, is that a genotype aspect of the cropping system or a management aspect? And again, don't, don't worry too much. The, uh, the distinction, at least here, is that, you know, the G it, our genotype is always a variety uh, that is very well adapted to the environment and very high yielding. So it's a high yielding adapted cultivar or species. So when we think of, hey, I want to start a banana farm in Ontario and let's say not like outdoors on in the greenhouse, there's no banana cultivar, banana variety that, you know, can survive. So we're limited in terms that cropping system would be very limited by the G component. There's no there's no banana that's high yielding and well adapted to Ontario. We can say it's a management component where a farmer is deciding, for example, do they want a variety that has a particular 
a herbicide tolerance trait or a particular particular um, is it a short variety or a, or a tall a tall variety or is it a variety that's resistant to a given disease uh, and a farmer is making a specific decision, then you can say there's overlap. I mean, number one, there has to be a variety on the market that has the attributes a farmer wants. Uh, but then a farmer is making a management decision like what are the attributes of a cultivar I want for my cropping system. But again, the bottom line is that I'm not too nitpicky. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer here. As long as you explain you know, a given aspect of a cropping system, you explain why you consider it G or M. For most, you know, for most of these cases, it's not going to be an issue. Crop rotation is a foundational piece of the cropping system. And so, again, important to define at the start. It's the sequence of crops grown on the field. And in Ontario, I'd say most of Canada, we grow one crop a year. So our crop rotations have are basically on an annual basis. In other parts of the world, for example, in parts of Brazil or in parts of China, they might have two or three crops, grain crops grown in a single year. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus on, you know, a more relevant case, say, upper northwest, uh, upper, sorry, upper midwest and, and Canada. So where we're growing one crop a year. So we have what we would call monoculture or continuous rotations where it's actually not a rotation. You're growing the same crop every single year. So corn on corn on corn, you're just continuing to grow corn, a given crop, the same crop. And so it's not a rotation, it's monoculture. You can have uh, two, three, four crop rotations as well. As you see here, you're growing uh, one crop one year and a different crop the year after, a different crop the year after that, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, very common rotations in Ontario are talked about in a different video. And I would say different rotations in Canada. Okay, so what do you have to take away? Just understand this G by E by M framework, this foundation linchpin of the course, and understand that we care about the G, the E, and the M, as well as the interactions. And obviously understand the definition of, of, of things like what a crop rotation is. So now I want to tell you a few stories, give you a few examples of, of how we can use G by E by M to understand cropping systems and changes to cropping systems. So I'm going to start out with one of the most famous uh, evolutions in agricultural, agricultural productivity, which is the Green Revolution. Uh, the Green Revolution. So back in the 1950s, uh, many, many eminent scientists were predicting that we were going to run out of food. There was going to be a growing human population, and eventually we would not have enough food to feed people. And starting, you know, the prediction was that by the 1970s, there would be, you know, mass famine. Uh, and there was a very famous book published, uh, The Population Bomb, by Dr. Paul Ehrlich. So many people thought, hey, we're going to run out of food. But then this Green Revolution happened, and we had a growing population, and we had growing food supply, enough food, enough calories to feed everyone. Okay, so what happened? Well, the Green Revolution, if you've heard of it, it's most often tied to this one wheat breeder named Norman Borlaw. Now, the Green Revolution involved more than just one person. He's a figurehead, so it's not inaccurate, but in reality, we had... First off, many other scientists aside from Norman, and we also had farmers around the world that chose to invest in newer varieties of wheat and, and nitrogen fertilizers. So let me let me break this down into the G by E by M. So Norman Borla uh, was credited with a major advance in the G component of wheat-based and rice-based cropping systems where you're growing dwarfing cultivars of these varieties. So essentially you have traditional cultivars of, of wheat or rice uh, that are much taller. And then we have dwarf cultivars. Why is this important? It's important because uh, if you're growing wheat or rice, you're, uh, uh, you're scared of lodging. You do not want lodging to occur. And what that means is uh, when the crop falls flat on the ground, let me just show you a picture. This is what lodged uh, rice, uh, these are photos I took, lodged rice on the left and lodged, lodged barley, in this case, um, uh, on the right. And so when you have lodge crops, the yields go down, and it's just much more difficult to harvest. It's more difficult to harvest by hand, and even with the combine, with the machine, lodge crops, very difficult to harvest. Okay, so when you have a shorter crop, like what was developed, you have less chance of lodging. Now, <clears throat> uh, the other thing that these dwarf cultivars, modern dwarf cultivars did is because they're shorter, they allow uh, a farmer to apply higher rates of nitrogen 
and get higher yields because the traditional cultivars would take that nitrogen that a farmer would apply, and instead of producing more grain, they would just get taller and they would just get lodge more. So when you apply nitrogen to traditional cultivars, you wouldn't get a very large yield response. You get more lodged crops, more crops that look like that. Okay. Whereas with these modern dwarf cultivars, you can apply nitrogen and actually you're not going to get more lodging because they're going to say short and you're going to get higher yields. These, these are more responsive. We call these more responsive, more yield responsive to nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. So let me, uh, this is, this is the interaction that I'm talking about. The G by E by M example here. Okay. Uh, and here we're really talking about a G by M example because we have new genotypes that are better responsive, more responsive to nitrogen fertilizer applications with less lot and, and more responsive in terms of yield. Okay, so here we have um, yields of uh, three different varieties. We have an older wheat variety in the triangles and then a newer or dwarfing wheat variety in the squares. And we have grain yields at different nitrogen fertilizer application rates on the x-axis. Okay, so... Uh, what's the interaction? If farmers only applied higher nitrogen rates, so, you know, if Norman shows up, Norman Borla shows up to your village and you're a farmer and he says, I want you to apply more fertilizer. You got to buy it. And I want you to grow these seeds. You got to buy these as well. Maybe they're subsidized, but you still got to buy them. You know, a farmer has to decide to make that investment. So if a farmer just decided to increase nitrogen rates, they said, okay, I'm going to apply nitrogen. I'm not going to plant the new cultivars. You know, going from zero nitrogen fertilizer to 160 kilos of N, this is wheat, increases yields by about two tons per hectare. Okay, so that's pretty good, right? A two ton per hectare increase. You're not changing the variety. You're just uh, adding more fertilizer. Then let's say, you know what? You're not going to invest in any more fertilizer. You're just going to grow the new variety. Well, if you weren't applying any fertilizer at all, the new variety would actually be slightly lower yielding than the older wheat variety. Um, if you applied a very low rate, say 40 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, that's, that's, you know, uh, that's about a third of what a farmer would normally apply in Ontario, for example. So a fairly low rate of nitrogen, you would get about a one ton per hectare increase just by, just by changing your variety, right? So not changing your nitrogen rate, but just changing your variety, you're, you're going to get a slight increase if you're applying a, a relatively low nitrogen rate. But, and this is the interaction, if you plant a new variety of wheat, the newer dwarfing wheat, and you apply a higher rate of nitrogen, you're increasing your yields by 3.5 to 5 tons per hectare. Okay, so that's a multiplicative effect, right? Because if we go back here, right, we go back, you're just increasing nitrogen is 2 tons. Just increasing, just new variety is, well, let's say, 1 ton. But if you do both at the same time, you're getting 3.5 to 5 tons. That's more than if you just add it up. Okay, so it's a multiplicative effect. Higher, uh, higher nitrogen rates, that's the M. More new, newer varieties, that's the G. You get that interaction, and then we have a fantastic increase in agricultural productivity. So that's how G by M, G by E by M analysis works. Another story, another example. Crop rotations, like I said, foundational part of a cropping system. And rotating a legume and a cereal crop, a nitrogen-fixing and non-nitrogen-fixing crop, that was a practice independently discovered by prehistoric farmers on all inhabited continents. So all farmers across the globe figured out, hey, if you're growing corn, you got to rotate that with a legume. If you're growing wheat, you got to rotate that with a legume, potatoes, whatever. So they would be rotating legumes with non-nitrogen fixing crops. And that was commonly practiced up until fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers became widely available because then farmers did not need necessarily to have legumes for those, their nitrogen fixing properties. So with the removal of this nitrogen constraint, we have an increase in continuous, uh, continual cereal rotation. So continuous corn, for example. Um, also things like continuous wheat in other parts of North America. So, you know, uh, corn on corn rotations are important. They're profitable because corn is a valuable crop for livestock producers. Corn is valuable because you can apply high rates of manure to, to the, to those fields because the corn is going to be using that nitrogen. 
And and so there's there's reasons to have corn on corn rotations, but technology adoption played a major role. The impact of nitrogen fertilizers and something else I'm gonna tell you about. So in continuous cropping systems where you have a monoculture, the same crop being grown year after year, you get pest buildup. You know, that's a that's a major reason also to have crop rotation. You're you're reducing your pest burden, be that weeds be that insects or whatever. Now, in corn, we have different corn root worms. We have European corn borer. These are these are major pests, and they're normally dealt with with crop rotation, these insect pests. And the reason is because the life cycle of these insect pests basically require that corn or a, a suitable host, it doesn't have to be corn, but a suitable host is grown in that field year after year. Uh, you can see here the corn root worm life cycle as an example of these kinds of, of pests where uh, the summer before, <clears throat> in, in um, July and August, the adults are going to lay eggs. And then the next year, so they lay, lay eggs in the summer. And then the following year, uh, the uh, larvae are going to emerge and feed on corn roots. So if you're growing continuous corn, this is an issue. But if you're growing corn in rotation with a non-host, whatever, soybeans, uh, it's not an issue. But another technology has enabled you know, simple, more simple corn on corn rotations. And, and in many parts of the world, it's because of what we call the BT trait, or what's commonly known as the BT trait, which is genetically modified corn that uh, basically expresses a protein, BT. I mean, it's more complicated. I'm simplifying things, but it expresses a protein that is going to kill uh, many of these uh, insects that, that otherwise would decimate corn grown in continu a continuous corn crop uh, or a monoculture corn. Okay, so we have this BT protein. We have a change in the G because we have genetically engineered corn that's affecting M. Now we have more continuous corn uh, than we did before because we did not, don't have to worry about these uh, uh, insect pests. But this is changing again because now there is identified signs of resistance, resistant corn borer being found. Uh, it happened to be found in Canada and actually in, a, in, in, in the... Um, sorry, in the Maritimes, not really a corn growing region, but there is a now resistant corn borer being found. And so we might be having a breakdown of, of BT resistance. So this is just to show you that we have interactions, but it's not like the interaction stops once you discover this interaction. There's always these feedback loops. So we have a change in the G component, which is we get this BT trait introduced into corn. We have a change in M, which is more corn being grown, especially continuous corn. And then we have a back, uh, a feedback where we have a lot more corn, corn, continuous corn being grown, and that can develop. We can get more resistance because of that. Okay. So final example of G by E by M. Here we have um, really a combination of many different things going on looking at Northern Ontario cropping system. So uh, between 19, uh, sorry, 2006 and 2011, spectacular increase in grain corn and soybean acres in, in Northern Ontario. Uh, soybean acreage doubled again, actually between 2011 and 2016. So we have just incredible growth. Uh, what is going on? It's, uh, and let's analyze this question from a G by E by M framework. So, First of all, we have, over time, a warming climate, okay, climate change, and we have a warming climate, and that warming climate is making the growing season in Northern Ontario longer, and by growing season longer, I just mean from May 1st to um, uh, October 1st, we have more growing degree days being accumulated, okay, so we have just more growing degree days. As you know, that means that crops can reach maturity faster, and we can have longer season varieties. Okay, so we have a warming climate. Now let's talk about soybeans for a second. I'll focus here on soybeans. They're native to China. And in fact, when they were first introduced to Ontario, uh, the growing season, uh, they were not adapted to Ontario's growing season and they were used as a forage. Soybeans were used as forage. They would actually not mature and they actually wouldn't develop you know, seeds for, for harvest anywhere in Ontario, Southern Ontario or Northern Ontario, whatever. They were used as forage. But through lots and lots of breeding, and we don't have to get into the details, but via a lot of breeding, short season varieties were introduced, okay? That just means that uh, soybean uh, varieties that could actually reach maturity, reach maturity in Ontario's growing season and produce a harvestable grain 
okay? And so starting in the 1970s, soybean yields, uh, soybean yield and acreage really took off. And here you have a uh, relative maturity map. So across Ontario, this is review, hopefully for most of you, but uh, farmers in different zones, and you can see relative maturity, they're going to plant different maturity soybeans. So in the far southwest of Ontario, like around Sarnia, the, the, the border with Detroit, we're going to be planting a different ver, uh, maturity rating than a farmer, say, in uh, Alora or Guelph or in northern Ontario. Uh, so what, what do we have at the end of the day? What's the point? We have a change in G, which is that in the 1970s and, and up to today, breeders are releasing shorter and shorter season soybeans that can be reliably grown, reliably reach maturity at, uh, at short, in, short season, in short season zones like northern Ontario. We also have an E, which is that we have um, warmer and warmer growing seasons in northern Ontario. And you can see here, you know, over time, it's a trend. It's not like every year is always warmer than the, the last, but we have a warming trend that's very obvious. And so what that means is that we have shorter season varieties that can be reliably reach maturity. We have a warmer, a longer growing season with more growing degree day accumulation. And so we have this G uh, by E interaction that's really enabling farmers to grow more soybeans and also more corn. So the takeaway, so the takeaway is you should by now understand the G by E by M framework for analyzing cropping systems. You should also, you know, know the high level summary of each of our, of these three, uh, three examples, the three stories I shared with you to illustrate how to use G by E by M framework. And understand that we care m more about the interactions than just the individual components themselves because it's often in these interactions where we can actually explain agricultural productivity and explain cropping system performance.